My name is Mike Aben, and welcome to my KSP campaign. What you see me doing here is a significant amount of time warping to get to the completion of my next vehicle that you will be seeing very, very shortly. But while we're time warping, why don't we talk about what's coming up in this episode? At the conclusion of the last episode, we used the Cur use to get three new Kerbinauts up to Kerbin Station, and we will be revisiting those. Uh, those folks before the end of this video. Also coming up in this video is a return to the moon. Uh, to the moon with an unmanned lander. Uh, you might recall a number of episodes ago that Muna 3 went to the moon um, and it was a partial success. Some things went wrong, some things crashed, some things didn't, but what I'm doing is going back to the moon with Muna 4 which is a significant improvement in both size, ambition, and complexity. And that's going to be coming up fairly soon. But at first, why don't we take a look at what all this time warping is about. I've got me a car! Yes, rover wheels, finally we have a car. And we're going to go around because i got a new science part. I can do these atmospheric analysis. So uh, it's more science. We're going to go around the KSC and collect science. Wait a second. No, wait, wait. i got to... I want to transmit that, so I need to generate electricity. Now, normally, you'd equip these things with solar panels, but the hell with solar panels. I have fuel cells that so we can burn fuel to make electricity. Yes, solar panels be damned. Global warming be damned. <laughs> In the spirit of actually having a car, I thought I'd actually have a car that can burn. Oh, look at that electricity go down. I didn't put any batteries on this. Okay. An oversight on my part. I was all fixated on the fuel cells. I didn't even think about putting actually additional batteries on top of this thing. So that was pretty dumb. So, okay, transmitting. We're not going to transmit. We'll just keep that. And uh, we'll get Bob out and he'll do the good old collecting. This isn't going to be a particularly long mission. And we're not going to spend that much time with it. There's our... Uh, our device there, it is an atmospheric fluid spectrovariometer. And it analyzes atmospheres, I guess. But, uh, you know, it's a science part, so we'll collect the data and then we'll get Bob back and then we'll get out of here. Yeah, I thought in the spirit of actually getting a car for the first time, I'd actually make a car. So this thing runs on fuel. Um, <laughs> One thing that's a little bit dumb is that the fuel cells, I guess they never thought you'd be actually using them on in Kerbin's surface, so you actually have to bring oxidizer along. They can't use the oxygen that's in the atmosphere. So I got fuel and oxidizer. Oh, okay, the brake lights are backwards. That's not so good. I turned off the brakes and the brake lights came on, so we'll have to deal with that. But that wasn't so hard to deal with. And, and when I was testing this thing, I really tried to put it through the paces it's pretty stable so I'm, I'm gonna drive it pretty aggressively like rah, there we go I couldn't I couldn't flip it over even if I was trying to so uh, we can scoot around this should be a pretty easy thing to do and of course what we're going to do is we're gonna go to the various nooks and crannies in and around the research or uh, the KSC we'll get out to the usual nearby biomes like the shores and the grasslands and uh, and uh, collect our collect some stuff maybe get over towards the highlands as well this thing performed very, very well. It's a pretty dull mission, though, so uh, we'll just cut ahead. You know, it's just going to each of the little biomes, including the little microbiomes. Don't forget to hit all of those little extra things, like uh, like these antennas here at the tracking station. And uh, Bob, of course, will go out there and collect it. Everything was going uh, swimmingly, except uh, perhaps next time when I'm testing the robustness of a ground vehicle, I think I'll make sure to uh, test it on the crawlway. Oops. Oh, nothing like those texture edges. <laughs> well, that put an end to this particular mission. But, you know, even with this aborted mission, I ended up gathering uh, 96 science uh, for a total of 238 science. And with that... I mean, I could have held out and got uh, one of these Tier 7 nodes, but I decided just to pick up a quick Tier 6 node. I got the advanced landing, better landing gear and some drogue chutes. Um, I guess that could be useful, but to be honest, the main thing is I want is just the other build point that I put right into the vehicle assembly building, hoping that I will start pushing out my rockets a little quicker. Several episodes ago, I had this contract 
to uh, put an object in orbit around the moon and return it back to the surface of Kerbin. Simple enough. But that simple contract motivated Muna 3, a mission that was designed to be kind of a land and return mission. I thought, no, landing on the, or orbiting the moon, not enough. Got to land on the moon, then come back with an unmanned lander. And then I thought, well, that wasn't enough either. What I'll do is I'll use the seismic uh, sensor as modified by the interstellar mod to do some impact science on the moon. And uh, all of that didn't really go so well. Um, I didn't budget, and I didn't have enough fuel to get back, didn't have enough electricity in order to transmit back the seismic data. So the mission didn't go all that well. Well, you know the old saying, if at first you don't succeed, build something four times as complicated and try again. Then again, maybe it's just me that says that. This is Moon of Four. And uh, while I hunt around and look for a communitron that I can extend to maintain my connection with Mission Control, why don't we talk a little bit about this thing and what sort of the plan is. You know, with Muna 3, I had a single lander. The idea was it to land and return, and that didn't work. So, uh, obviously, the idea is I didn't have enough landers. I didn't have enough probes. So, all together here, this guy is four probes, and uh, three of which are landers. So, I'm going to land three on the moon. One's going to stay in orbit, at least for a little while. And this is the idea. This thing is going to be put into a polar orbit about the moon. I'm going to drop two of the small landers, one near the pole, either the North Pole or the South Pole, doesn't matter, and one near the equator. Then that main lander, which is the main body of this thing, um, it's going to land at the equator but 90 degrees approximately, or near the equator, and about 90 degrees from uh, the other one that's on the equator, so that all three of these will be uh, 90 degrees apart on the surface of the moon. That is the ideal placement in order to do the impact science that is packed with the interstellar mod that I've successfully did on Kerbin, attempted to do on the moon previously, and now I'm going to attempt again. Um, and then finally the fourth probe that is on there is not a lander at all. That is purely there as my impactor. Its only job is to crash into the moon to create the impact so we can collect the impact science. The main probe then should be able to, the idea is to return back to Kerbin and come back down to the surface. It's equipped with a heat shield, it's equipped with parachutes, so that the whole science package, theoretically, should be recovered. But as we know, theory and practice, not always the same thing. Alrighty, just about there enough all right we are on our way to the moon and about an hour and 20 minutes later we are performing a correction burn so that we can insert ourselves into a polar orbit once we get there there we go that ought to do it and of course several hours after that we were completing our insertion into our polar orbit about the moon with that done, let's start thinking about dropping our first lander. So, to do that, we need to raise its communitron, we need to deploy its solar panel, and this one we're going to put down near the equator. We'll drop that one first, then one up near the pole, and then we'll try and land moon of four at 90 degrees near the equator, away from the first one that we dropped. Um, and I'm eyeing this area right here this is the twin craters i know it's a little bit south of the equator but i also want to land in a biome that i know i have not landed in yet again for the science of course that leaves us with some time warping to do until the point that the moon rotates so that the twin craters are below our orbit and of course you can see we're using mapsat here to give us a hand with the map that uh, we have made and oh, wait a second i think i have the wrong crater selected here Noticing that the dots on the mini map are clearly going to the north, yet my satellite on the big map is clearly moving to the south. Wait, let's click on this a bit. Oh dear, here we go. Okay, let's see where we're at here. Ooh, and I can see on the mini map that on my next turnaround, I'm going to be coming right over the twin craters. So this is going to be it. So let's time warp over to the other side of the moon and get this show on the road. Okay, so let's, we're in the dark, so let's check the electricity. 
Eh, it's not bad. His battery's a little low. We might as well steal what we can. Certainly don't want to low, uh, you know, run out of electricity, so we'll steal it from this other probe and it'll, it'll charge you up later. Okay, so there we go. It has two batteries, so we'll do that with the other one as well. Yep, you'll get a chance to charge up later, little guy. Okay, so let's decouple this thing. And, oh, wait, wait, let's, if I control from here, I think then when I decouple, I'll be with the probe, right? No, <laughs> I don't think I am. I think I'm still on the main vessel. I don't understand how it went. In. Okay, we'll get on the probe. Here's our little probe. Anyway, this guy, I built it small. It's it. This was all about weight because uh, Muna 4 had to take three of them out here and uh, still get itself back to curb and surface. So this thing only weighs 582 kilograms when it's fully fueled. And its fuel is just monopropellant. That's it. Okay, so let's get ourselves into position to get down on the surface, do a little bit of time warping. I like to be about... I don't know, around a third of a uh, rotation, a third of an orbit away from my landing spot to start my descent burn, so I come in nice and shallow. So I figure starting my burn in around the North Pole, that should be about right. Okay, let's rename this. This is probably, yeah, Muna Probe, or Muna 1 Probe, that's silly. Muna 1-A, there we go. And it's also a lander, of course, not a, so we'll put, there we are. All right, we are good. Okay, let's see here. You can still see Muna 4 down there. Pretty. All right, I think. Just looking at where I am, I think I'll time warp still a little bit further. Because there are some, uh, looks like some highlands before I get to the crater. I don't know if it's an official highland biome, but they do look like they're highlands. Let's see, that ought to do it. Okay, retrograde. I'm not going retro. Oh, wait. Oh, I'm still. <laughs> I was still time warping there. Okay, there we go. Now I can put it on to the retrograde icon. Where is it? There we go. Now, I am just working with RCS, so uh, I have to do this. I'm going to have to put on the RCS and press H. There we go. And it goes, as you can see, in little bursts like this. So I'm just doing little taps on the H key until it looks about right. Let's get, oh, 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 that's, that's pretty good. Okay, let's turn on the RCS. Now that was pretty jerky. I think my thrust to weight ratio is a little bit high. You can see all I have on the bottom here are these uh, linear RCS ports. And the reason why I use them is because they're really light. So if I disable two of them, that will only give me, that, that cuts my thrust in half. I don't know if I want to do that. I could also play with the thrust limiter. Yes, I've never noticed that on our, I guess I never, I guess it was always there. I just never noticed it, that there's a thrust limiter on RCS. So let's turn them down about half. If I turn them down around half, that'll give me about 75% of the thrust I had before. So I think that, ooh, ooh, that's exactly on 40. That's a nice number. We'll put that one on 40. Now, I don't know about you, whoops, but I find adjusting these sliders so that they are exactly what you want them to be, to be a real pain. 41's not good. 39.5's not good. Come on. You can do it. We're only falling to our deaths here anytime. 40. That's it. Good. All right. Okay. So let's orient this. I want to make sure that that solar panel is going to keep. Oh, wait. I got RCS on. Shoot. Oh, well, that's one of the downsides of doing this with uh, RCS thrusters. Actually, the other downside, the bigger downside, is that uh, I have no, let's put the surface data on because I'm going to need that, but I have no useful vessel data, vessel data coming at me from Kerbal Engineer. I do not know my remaining delta V. I do not know my thrust to weight ratio. I don't have a suicide burn distance. All of that stuff is not being provided to me. 
I could have gone with those monoprop engines. That would have solved that issue, but those guys are pretty high, pretty heavy relatively to these things. They're heavy and more powerful. So again, weight, that was the thing. Okay, well, let's time warp ourselves a little bit closer. All righty. You know, I think I'll uh, bring that trajectory down just a little bit more. So I'll make sure I'm on the retrograde vector there. Yeah. Yeah, I think I can do this. Okay, we'll put on RCS. Just a couple of puffs. There we go. Let's take a look at that. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. Maybe that wasn't such a good idea. I think I'm going to clear the ridge there, but, you know, maybe I should play it safe and puff. You know, before I do this, let's check. Oh, my gosh. I have a little bit. What's that? Just over 44. No, I can't wait. Oh, man, that's how much monoprop I only have left. Okay. Um, now, I didn't start with it full. I actually started with these. Honestly, I can't quite remember. About maybe three quarters full. I'm not sure. <laughs> to be honest, I don't remember what I started them off with. Um, again, I was trying to say wait, but maybe... Oh, geez. Now, you know, with no Delta V coming from Kerbal Engineer, I, I need to play this as efficiently as I can. So what I think I'll do is just not do any more burns until I'm ready to do that final descent. So why don't we uh, just cut straight to that? Okay, I'm about four and a half kilometers from the surface. About negative 24 meters per second for my vertical velocity. I do want to make sure I land in the twin craters. So my, oh, there, the biome just said twin craters. And actually, that terrain up ahead is looking pretty lumpy. And I'm not going, now yeah, let's do it. I'm not going to have a lot of options, a lot of twiddling time as I come down. So I do want to make sure I don't end up in any area that's too cratery. So let's get this done. So I'm just holding down the H key and I'm nervously looking at my monopropellant gauge at the same time. But obviously I need to start killing off my velocity right now. Okay, horizontal velocity, what's that, getting close to 250 meters per second. Need to get that a lot lower than that. I'm starting to pick up vertical speed. Want to keep that to a minimum. So I'm pitching up a little bit while I'm doing this. I'm thinking maybe that big crater, if I can land into that, hoping the, the you know, that crater I'm heading towards there, I'm hoping that maybe it's not too sloped inside the crater. But... I really do not have options. It's going to be what it's going to be at this point. Because I don't have the fuel to uh, be too picky about my landing spot. I'm going to keep it right pretty close to a little bit. If I keep the pitch, just I'm, I'm on the retrograde vector because I do want to control that vertical velocity at the same time. Uh, I'm going to come short of the big crater, I think. Oh, f in fact, it's looking more like I'm going to land on the ridge between these two craters. Oh, I could have planned that better. All right, what am I at here? Well, 1.3 kilometers from the surface. One kilometer from the surface. Let's start doing this. Vertical block, 40 meters per second. I'm getting a feel too from the thrust how much I, I still slow myself down very, very quickly. There's a lot of thrust on this little thing. Oh, I think, okay. Getting close, 60 meters, okay, I see my shadow. Oh man, it's, it's still like a little bit too much thrust. It's, you know, you get these like, you know, you don't have fine control at all. Touch and oh, I'm sliding and I'm tipping. I'm tipping. Oh, I'm down. Okay. Okay. Let's let's not do anything and let's just think. Let this thing come to a rest. Um, it's okay if it's on its side as long as if that communitron breaks, it's it's going to be dead. And it is down. Everything is looking good. Let's retract the landing gear. Okay, I probably could flip it up, but I'm not going to. Let's turn off the SAS. 
and just see if it just sits here all right. Mm -hmm. uh, still, nothing's broken. It's there. That's it. And the solar panels are well positioned. It is charging. I have communication. This is good. I mean, it wasn't pretty, but it's completely functional. I can, I can start collecting the science here. So let's, uh, let's start doing that. While I'm doing that, and I, I could have planned this a little better. Like one thing I could have done is how about uh, you know, for about a thousand or so curb bucks, I could have bought some time in the Kerbal Construction Time Simulator and actually practice landing this thing. That was my first attempt trying to land this thing, as you can probably tell, but I'm going to take this and run. This is fine for me. So we're going to be collecting science. We're going to be transmitting science. That's all going to go pretty standardly, but then it's time to start thinking about our other probe. Now that first probe was a little jerky. I could have had the thrust down a little bit lower than, than I did, and I thought about turning the thrust on this one down even further, but the thing is, is I had some practice now with with that first one. I had some practice, and so I thought best not to uh, mess with things too much. Let's turn these ones down to just about the same settings, because I did get a bit of a feel for the first one. The last thing I want to do is start changing the variables even more now that I got a little bit used used to that this landing this probe, even though it's still less than ideal. And what I'm shooting for is a spot. I'm not going for the North Pole. Um, instead, I'm going to go for a spot that's a little bit to the south of the North Pole because that A probe went to a spot a little bit south of the equator, and then that way uh, they'll still be about 90 degrees from each other. And to be honest, that was probably for the best because, I mean, here I am coming over the North Pole and just look at it. Yeah, it would be pretty tough to put yourself down in here. And to be honest, it's a little bit disheartening because, I mean, one of these days I'll probably end up building a moon base. And one of the things I was thinking about was there is a sort of a real world idea of putting a moon base at one of the poles. And at the top of hills, at the poles, you have hills that are in perpetual sunlight. And you could get solar all the time. And I thought that would be a pretty cool thing to try in KSP, to put a moon base at the pole and put some solar panels at the top of one of these hills where I think they would be always in the sunlight. And that way you have constant solar. I thought that would be pretty cool. It would definitely be a challenge though, given this terrain. And by the way, the reason the terrain is like this, and it's the same sort of deal at the South Pole, is because uh, of the way the textures wrap around. I mean, textures are drawn on a flat rectangle and then you wrap them around a sphere like the moon, and then they get all kind of bunched up at the poles. So uh, it's just kind of a nature of a video game that you get something as extreme as this. Anyway, you can see I put myself a waypoint, and I put the waypoint at a spot that uh, looked relatively flat. And why don't we just cut to uh, my actual descent. I see a relatively flat area coming up before the waypoint, so I'm gonna shoot for that. There's no reason for me to actually go for the waypoint. And uh, that this is now my second time landing a probe like this one. The first one, of course, was identical to this one, and that first bit of practice really paid off now for the second one. This second one went really without any problems, any issues at all. Oh, and by the way, with the first one, I was guessing, I was confused. I wondered how much monoprop I had put into these. I completely forgot since the time that I built this and put it into the building queue. How much did I budget as far as monoprop? Turned out, actually, I checked with this one. I only started it with 45.43 units of the available 80 that's in that small monoprop can. That's only 57% full. Uh, that's pretty stingy, really. I think if I were to do this again, uh, I would be a little bit more generous with, uh, with my monoprop. But as you can see here, this particular touchdown uh, went just fine. Ooh, a little bit of a bounce, but there we are, we're down. And according to Kerbal Engineer, I am still in the pole's biome, so that's fantastic. My solar panel could perhaps have been positioned a little bit better, but I think this will do. So it's time for us to start collecting us some science. And then of course it's gonna be Moon of 4's turn, the uh, main probe's turn to land, but I want it to land 
near the equator about 90 degrees from this one. So for that, we're going to need to wait for the moon to turn about a quarter of a rotation. That's going to take about a day and a half. So in the meantime, I got me another launch to do. This is a whole lot of fuel. A whole lot of fuel on its way to Kerbin Station so that we can fuel up the Karine and get it ready for its next mission, which is to exit the Kerbin Sphere of Influence. But uh, this is not just more, it's a little more than just a whole bunch of fuel, because you've seen me uh, launch fuel barges before. In fact, I've launched uh, a few fuel barges before. Every time the Karines come back from a mission, I've had to refuel it with another fuel barge. And I got rather sick of keep continually sending up fuel barges. So this is actually really more of a fuel module. This is going to permanently attach itself to Kerbin Station. Um, and it should be enough fuel in that orange can to refuel the Karayan three or four times over. Uh, so this should be the last bunch of fuel I send up for quite some time. Why don't we cut up to Apoapsis where we can take a better look at this thing. Oh, just listen to those engine sounds. They're just glorious, aren't they? And by the way, ignore the uh, kind of <laughs> alternating. This thing looks like a Christmas tree, for goodness sakes, the way it's blinking like that. Um, that's because I forgot to put those lights onto the light action group and had to turn them on one by one, so they are all out of sync. But I, I think I got a trick coming up to fix that. But I'll get to that in just a little bit. Right now, we are just about ready to detach our liquid fuel boosters. Okay, there we go. Periapsis are up 50 kilometers. Detach. Okay, we'll fire up that engine. It's just actually a little poodle engine on the end there. Let's see if we can just nudge ourselves a little bit forward. So, uh, yeah, let's take a look at the, the idea is to get this orange tank up to uh, Kerbin Station completely full. So at the very, very back, there's actually a little bit of a transfer vehicle, which is not much more than the smallest of the 2.5 meter fuel tanks and a poodle engine. That's about it. At the front, as you can see, there's a docking port. So this is going to dock with the station and uh, be a permanent new module for it. And just below the whole docking port assembly, I have another one of these Kerbal inventory um, supply containers uh, except this one is going to stay up there with the station and inside that I have as per usual all kinds of little goodies to help us uh, improve upon our station but we will get to that later let's see if I can deal with these stupid blinking lights all right okay we are on our way to Kerbin station now as for these blinking lights I'm going to, I think if I just leave this vessel and come back to it. So I'm going to switch over to the target here, which is actually Kerbin Station. So we're just going to bop over to Kerbin Station. And then once at Kerbin Station, I'm just going to switch immediately back to my fuel module. And ha <laughs> now they are all in sync. There we go. Problem fixed. I know that was a trivial problem, but I don't know. It was bugging me. And speaking of trivial, it turned out docking this thing turned out to be a pretty trivial exercise. And you've seen me do lots of dockings in the past. It was pretty massive, so I had to take my time. It's definitely the most massive thing I've ever docked. But uh, I went in there easy enough. And, uh, you know, once it's docked, we'll have to do a lot of, uh, quite a bit of construction. I got three engineers on the station, so uh, no shortage of hands to start putting things together. And then we'll fuel up the Karayan, send, send it on its way out of Kerbin Sphere of Influence. It'll be our first Kerbals to leave the Kerbin Sphere of Influence. We also have to obviously go back to Moon of Four and finish off that mission and see if I can not perform the... Uh, the impact science and then get Moon of Four back to Kerbin's uh, surface. So a lot of stuff coming up and it's all going to have to be for the next episode. I'm going to draw this one to a close. I thank you for watching and I hope to see you next time.